The content and any opinions in this talk are mine alone and do not reflect the views and opinions of my employer. We need to be aligned. We need to be on the same page. Because automation is here. It's affecting how we treat diseases. It's giving us insights into solving the problems of our time. And it's already affecting how we work. This is something that's not only going to affect you and me, but millions of people around the world. So we need to be aligned. We need to be on the same page so that we're the ones that have a say in how automation is used and who it affects. This is why I'm here today. To help you have that say, I'm going to explain not only what automation is, but why it's so impactful. Automation is defined as any technology that does work while reducing human effort. Well, when we think about work in the context of automation, maybe one of the first things that comes to your mind is a machine of some kind, right? Maybe doing some heavy physical task like lifting something. But what I want to highlight is that over the past few decades, we've started to use software more and more to do work. And we're at a point in time now where software can do some really incredible things, like drive a car, create art, or even suggest movies and TV shows. Yes, this really is my Netflix homepage. Please don't judge. <laughs> don't judge. So software can help us to do work. It's just that the type of work is more cerebral, it's more cognitive in nature. And when we talk about automation, what we're really referring to is some combination of software and hardware together. And it's really this combination that is so smart and so capable that it is able to do work in many industries. And by virtue of that, it's able to reduce the amount of human effort needed in those industries. So I actually work in an industry that uses automation. As an automation scientist, my job is to work really closely with scientists in the biotech industry, spend the time to understand their experiments and scientific workflows, and then with that understanding, I program special robots like these that are able to replicate those tasks. They reduce the amount of effort that scientists need to do in the lab every day. But usually when I tell people what I do for work, I don't give them that whole spiel. Usually I say I use cool robots to do even cooler science. <laughs> so what's the value for robots like these in biotech? For those of you that aren't super familiar with biotech, this is an industry that develops therapies that we use to treat diseases. And the problem is that for a given disease, it typically takes one to two billion dollars and 10 to 15 years to develop and approve an effective therapy. But despite this time, money, and effort, 90% of therapies that enter clinical trials fail. Ninety percent of therapies fail. And this is a problem that affects us. For patients with critical diseases like Alzheimer's or cancer, heart disease, for example, being able to reduce the time it takes to develop a therapy can quite literally be life-saving. So is it possible then to reduce that time? I'm going to walk you all through three ways in which leveraging automation in the lab, in biotech, can help us to answer that question. Firstly, leveraging automation allows us to work with a lot of things at once. So for example, this robot here 
is transferring 384 samples at once and sending each of these samples off to be tested somewhere. Now, a researcher could do the same task manually, but that would take a lot of effort. They'd be in the lab, pipetting things back and forth, eight at a time, until they were blue in the face. It's unnecessary effort. And so robots like these not only help us to reduce that effort, but they allow us to work with a lot of things, like drug therapies, and test those things in a shorter amount of time. Second, leveraging automation allows us to be both precise and accurate with the samples we work with. So, for example, in this image here, each of those tiny droplets that you see, that's two microliters in volume. That's an incredibly small amount of anything to work with, right? This is like a drop of water. And if I was to do an experiment, for example, where I had to manually add a very precise amount of water to each of those little droplets, doing that task manually would probably result in error. And so robots like these really help us to be precise and accurate. And it helps us to minimize error that occurs during testing. And finally, leveraging automation allows for what I like to call traceability. If you're working with a lot of samples, hundreds, thousands of samples at one time, and each sample is undergoing five different tests, that's a lot of complexity. And nowadays, most labs use specialized software to handle that complexity. And software can help us to ensure that the correct results are applied to the correct samples. So going back to our question, right? Can we reduce the time it takes to develop therapies? If we start to leverage automation, if we start to leverage all those things that I just described, the answer is yes. We absolutely can. And if that sounds too good to be true, consider that the COVID-19 vaccines were developed in about a year thanks in part to automated infrastructure. Now, I say in part because it really is just part of the story. Because the advancements that we're seeing in biotech and so many other industries leveraging automation isn't only because of automation. It's also because of people. When industries leverage automation, the value the value is found when people and automated systems work together. Because the reduction in effort that automation facilitates helps us, in turn, to do our best work. I see this in the lab every day. Okay, so people, automated systems working together, right? That's where the value is. But what happens if we removed people from this picture? What would an automated world look like? I can confidently say that that world looks like a grocery store. No joke. In 2019, I walked into a grocery store to buy a Red Bull and a Twix bar. Now, I do want to stress that at the time I was a younger man, <laughs> I could eat, whatever crap I wanted and get away with it, all right? Nowadays, it's a different story. If I did that same stuff, I'd be up all night. So anyway, I walk into the store, I get my Red Bull, I get my Twix bar, and then I just walk out. I didn't wait in line. I didn't tap my credit card. I just took what I needed, and I walked out. Now, this isn't the story of how I became a criminal. Because about two minutes later, uh, about two minutes later, as I'm walking down the street, I get a notification on my phone. And that notification showed not only what I had taken out of the store, but how much I was charged for each item. That store exists. It's made by Amazon, and if you're in Seattle, you can go there and have the exact same experience that I did. I'm telling you this story because the reality is that there are industries like retail, fast food, for example, where 
automation, the technology that we have today, is smart enough and capable enough to not just reduce human effort, but almost eliminate it. In that store that I just described, there were, I think at most, like five people, five employees, none of whom were cashiers. So this is the unfortunate reality. But I do want to stress that this technology isn't here yet. We still have some time. But what do we do when automation starts to push more and more people out of these industries? Are we as a society ready and able to take care of these people? Do we even want to? Is this type of technology something that you personally are comfortable with? These are some really big, big questions, and fortunately, I don't have the answer to them. But what I do know is that we need to spend some time now to think, to reflect, because if we don't, when the time comes for us to have a say, to speak up, we'll either make a very rushed decision about how this technology should be used, or we simply won't have a say at all. So it may seem then that automation really is causing some big societal problems here. But I also think it's the answer to helping us solve some even bigger ones. And I'm going to highlight this by telling you about a game. There's a game called Go that's been played for over 3,000 years. To win requires not just strategy, but creativity. In 2016, a piece of software called AlphaGo played five matches against the world's best Go player. AlphaGo won four of those matches. But what was incredible about this was not the fact that software won. What was incredible was that AlphaGo displayed creativity while it was playing. A lot of its moves seemed like they were mistakes because they went against conventional wisdom. But in retrospect, those moves were the reason why AlphaGo won. How do you make software that's creative? And also, why? I mean, creativity, creativity is kind of a human thing, right? Now software is coming over to take over that too. Well, in terms of the how, AlphaGo wasn't programmed. It learned how to play Go like you and I would. AlphaGo played Go against people. And at the end of every match, it reflected on that match and used the insights that reflection provided to learn and grow itself. But the difference between AlphaGo and, let's say, you and me, is that after only three weeks of learning, AlphaGo was able to obtain the equivalent of 80 years of experience. That's like playing Go nonstop for 80 years straight without eating or sleeping. And the scale of that experience translated into new ways of playing this game. It showed players new ways, new perspectives about what was possible. So what's exciting here is not the fact that we can use this kind of software to play games, but that we can use it to help us solve the problems of our time. Problems like nuclear fusion, where software that is capable of reflection is helping us, helping researchers with insights into how to control this very complex reaction, getting us one step closer to clean, renewable energy for all. Or the problem of protein folding, where this type of software is helping researchers predict the structures of disease-causing proteins, and it's actually helping them to develop therapies against those proteins. The list really does go on. This is genuinely the tip of the iceberg. Think about any big global issue, you know, climate change, deforestation, malnutrition, and there is a real value here for this kind of software. Because these problems 
require creative insights. They require fresh perspectives to solve. And that's where software like this can come in. And what's even more exciting is that this, all this is happening right now, and it's being used to make our world a better place. So I don't know about you, but this kind of world that I've been describing, it's kind of crazy, right? How do you navigate this kind of world? I'd like to leave all of you today with three insights that I hope will not only help you navigate an automated world, but help you succeed in it. Insight number one, you are important. As more and more industries leverage automation, we need people who can speak up when red flags, when mistakes occur, when these systems fail and make mistakes. For example, if you're working in an organization that's using software to hire people, but that piece of software appears to be disproportionately excluding certain groups of people, that alarm needs to be raised. So you, your voice, can be used to ensure that automation is helping people. Insight number two, communication is key. The people that are able to succeed in an automated world are those that can communicate. They're people that have a really strong working knowledge of their industry and technology and are able to communicate that knowledge to key decision makers that want to use this technology. And finally, when it comes to automation, reflection saves lives. It's so important to think about the people that are being affected by automation. As industries like healthcare, for example, leverage this technology to make decisions about patient health, for example, it's important to consider who is being affected before the technology is rolled out. My hope is that understanding what automation is will help us to be more aligned, will help us to be on the same page. And I hope that we really spend the time to think and reflect on the people that are and will be affected by this technology. Because while automation can be a really powerful force for positive change, it can also harm people. But I'm confident that together, we can ensure that an automated world benefits everyone. Thank you.